This is going to be the first in a series of brief discussions that cover specific topics that are relevant when you think about the way that the theology in Mormonism comes to play in real life. And today, I'd like to talk a little bit about something that you hear frequently when you talk to people about issues in the church, specifically free agency. Anytime somebody who leaves the church talks with somebody who's still a believing member, usually you'll get the concept of, well, you have your free agency, you can choose to do whatever you want. Frequently, this comes up in issues of, for example, tithing. The church instructs its members that they should pay tithing, and there are a number of scriptures that um, support this concept. And if you look at the article on the blog called Tithing Cheer Versus Fear, we explore some of the scriptures that go behind that. One of the things that you'll hear, though, is that um, tithing is voluntary. You know, members are not forced to pay tithing. They're not coerced into paying tithing. And so let's talk a little bit about force or coercion and how that comes to play in these types of religions. So let's take an example of you standing on the side of the street and um, somebody comes up to you and has a gun and they point it at you and they say, I want you to go to this ATM that's across the street and withdraw 10% of your tithing or else I'm going to kill you. Now, the question is, do you have free agency at that point? Now, one, one perspective could be that you do have free agency. You could choose not to go and do what the man says, in which case you would lose your life. But you still have the agency to choose. But when you step back and, and look at it, what they're asking you to do is they're putting you in a position where you have to choose between your life and doing what they tell you to do. And realistically speaking, any time a gun is in the room, free agency goes out the window because any choice that you made is between your life, your existence, and what you are being instructed to do. So it's no longer free agency. There's now a level of force and coercion that are involved. Now let's take it a step back and let's say that instead of having the gun in your hand, let's say that they take the gun and they put it behind their jacket and they simply point at you and they say, okay, I've got a gun. You can't see the gun, but it's there. And they tell you the same thing. I want you to take me across the street, go to the ATM and take 10% of your money and give it to me. You look and you can see the bulge of the gun, but you don't see the gun, but you still believe that they have the gun. Is this a situation where you have free agency or is there force still involved? Well, to the extent that you believe that your life is still at risk, then there's still force involved. If you think that they could kill you, that they probably do have a gun, then you're still gonna comply and there's no such thing as free agency. Now let's take it even a step further than that. Let's say that they don't have the gun, they, but they tell you, I want you to go and give me 10% of your money from this ATM machine or else next week I'm gonna kill your family. Now let's suppose you know that this person is a member of a mafia or, or some group that has a track record of doing those things and so you believe them that if you do not comply with their instructions right now, they will kill your family or kill you. Is this a situation of free will? I would say that it's not. It's still the same situation where you're forced to comply with their demands. Now let's take it a step further. Let's say that they tell you that you need to go and withdraw 10% of your money or else after you die, they will prevent you from seeing your family for the rest of eternity, you'll be completely cut off from your family. And this is where we cross the threshold, because now we're talking about the type of consequences that Mormon instructions on tithing actually have. So you'll hear in Mormonism, tithing referred to as fire insurance. Um, you'll hear tithing as one of the questions in the Temple Recommend interview. And the underlying theme, the underlying current behind all of those instructions is that if you are not current on your tithing, if you're not paying your tithing, then you will burn up at Christ's coming or that you will not have access to the blessings of the temple in the hereafter. And those blessings include being able to exist with your family and share the company of your family into the eternities. So if somebody tells you that you need to give them 10% of your income, or else you're not going to have access to your family for the eternities. Conceptually, it's no different 
than a man who's pointing a gun at you or pointing a gun at your family and saying, give me 10% of your income. Now, this is only true to the extent that you believe that the person who is telling you this can actually carry out on the threats. So people who have the most basic understanding of Joseph Smith the prophet and what he taught, the revelations that he received that were the foundation for these ideas that if you don't pay tithing, that you will be deprived of your family in the eternities or that you'll burn up at Christ's second coming. If you believe that, that Joseph Smith has the authority to make those statements and have them be absolutely authoritative, then it's the equivalent of the, the man who's hidden the gun under his cloak and you believe that he will actually be able to carry it out. But if you've done the research and you understand that Joseph Smith did not have the authority to make that statements, that coercive statements such as that are completely inconsistent with notions of free agency, then it loses its power. And you realize that they have no power or authority to make those types of statements. You're not in jeopardy of losing your family if you don't pay tithing. And the funny thing is, when you go out and you explore how other religions deal with this issue, you'll find that many of them don't use the concept of fear, fear of losing your family, fear of losing your life, as a way to enjoin their members to give money to the organization. A lot of Christian organizations use the concept of a cheerful heart. They invite their members to donate out of a cheerful heart. If they feel that the organization is one that is deserving of their support, then they invite them to pay. But it's not done under any threat or coercion that there will be any blessings denied them. And so when you think, I think in Mormonism, we have a, a tendency to look at other religions with a great deal of suspicion, specifically if the religion seems to be very financially well-to-do. And this may go as far back as uh, the original temple ceremony, which had a Protestant preacher who was paid, in that case by, by Satan, to preach religion to the proxy Adam and Eve. And that concept that pastors and preachers who receive money for the work that they do in religion um, is in the Book of Mormon condemned and um, has always been talked about very poorly uh, by Mormon officials. But let's take a look at two different organizations. Let's look at a church that has become very prosperous. They receive a great number of donations from many of their, their congregation members. But the way that they instruct their congregation in how to go about donating to the church is not that they have to definitely donate 10% of all of their income and if they don't donate it, then they'll risk it losing their soul, losing their standing with God, or losing their family. Instead, they simply say, if you feel like we as an organization are deserving of your support, we invite you to donate with a cheerful heart to the extent that you can and want to. So if an organization with that philosophy towards donations becomes very prosperous, then the degree of their prosperity is simply a reflection of the value that they bring to the lives of their congregation members. And so it is not something to look down upon or con to condemn that they have a great deal of material prosperity. This is particularly true if the organization is financially transparent. That is, if it's like many of the churches where they periodically and regularly give financial reports that include all of the donations received, and all of the money spent on various projects. And many of these organizations include congregation members on the boards that oversee the selection of which projects to undertake, which vendors to undertake, which contracts to employ, so that there is a minimization of the risk of fraud, waste, and abuse, and conflicts of interest. So if you have an organization that is ethical in the way that it receives money, and is accountable in the way that it acts as stewards over those monies, then as a Mormon, it's actually uh, just very inappropriate for you to look on those successful organizations with any degree of criticism. Because in Mormonism, the way that monies are obtained from the members is under a threat of force that we covered at the beginning of this discussion. It's done out of fear. The members are enjoined to pay or else they'll lose their family or lose their eternal position in relation to God. And then once they give that money, the institution itself has zero accountability to the members. There's no financial statements. 
there's no visibility on the part of the members in terms of how much money the church received and exactly to which people or which projects those monies go to. And so it is a, a difference that you, you really only appreciate when you step outside of Mormonism and you see how other churches operate. Now, I think that a lot of organized religion ends up falling prey to some of these coercive tactics. Mormonism is not the only religion that uses fear to enjoin its members to pay. And so if you decide to affiliate with another religion after you leave Mormonism, then it's important to identify those things that are really the foundational problems with how Mormonism conducts itself, how it handles things like accountability, and choose an organization that uh, is accountable and that is ethical in the way that it enjoins its members uh, to pay. And that's it.